Well, hello, ladies of Prince George Church. Um, thanks for joining us for our first digital ladies Bible study. Um, I'm really sad that I don't get to meet with y'all in person um, and experience the wonderful conversation and discussion and questions that y'all usually have in these um, these book studies. Um, so I really hope um, that we uh, can get back to normal as soon as possible and be back uh, meeting and fellowshipping and, and discussing together. Uh, but we're going to be picking up uh, where we left off in our study, Atonement, The Atonement by Leon Morris. We're going to be in chapter four today. Uh, the Passover. So if you if you haven't read the chapter yet, this is a great time to pause the video and go do that. And if you have read the chapter, um, uh, go grab your book and open it to chapter four, the Passover. I will simply be uh, sharing some highlights um, that I found through the chapter. And I hope that um, as I do that, it'll be uh, meaningful and, and helpful to y'all. Um, and uh, I hope this is uh, um, uh, somewhat of a replacement for the great conversation and discussion that we normally have over this book. As we begin uh, our study, would you please pray with me? This is a collect for endurance from morning prayer. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, we're in chapter 4 of The Atonement. I know this has been a challenging book for all of us, myself included, um, but I think it's been very rich, and I hope that it uh, still is. And so as we discuss this, um, for uh, just a few minutes tonight, just a few highlights that I'd like to share, I hope it, uh, it helps. Um, and I really hope uh, if you have if you have any questions, if you have a follow up, uh, feel free to email me and I'd love to uh, try to further the conversation and discussion that way. The first thing I wanted to point out was on page 89, um, where he says the first full paragraph, he mentions that uh, the Israelites were in bitter bondage in Egypt. Um, the, the Passover as a feast assumes um, a background and that background is slavery in Egypt. Um, and our celebration of Passover, what we do in Holy Communion, and we'll get to the parallels uh, in just a little bit, um, and that also assumes a background. It assumes the background uh, that we were also slaves. We were in slavery, but our slavery wasn't to Pharaoh physically. Our slavery was to sin spiritually. We don't like to talk about slavery um, as a category of sin anymore. Uh, I think we are fairly uncomfortable with the idea of slavery um, and uh, sin being slavery. But it is an important biblical theme, motif. Jesus himself said, the one who practices sin is a slave to sin. And uh, we've talked about uh, before in our conversations how part of uh, what it takes to understand the, the awesomeness and the gloriousness of what Jesus has done for us is an appropriate understanding of how bad our situation is apart from him. Apart from Jesus and the work of the cross, we are enslaved. We cannot break ourselves free from the slavery to sin. We can't simply choose not to sin or choose to be perfect morally. Um, we are in a state of slavery to sin. That is the background that Passover assumed, they, that the Israelites were in a state of slavery to Pharaoh, and the Passover is the moment of deliverance. Um, similarly, uh, our celebrations, our understandings of the redemption that we have in Jesus assume in, a, in its background um, that we are enslaved to sin, that we, we can't help ourselves out of it, that we need a savior to come in from the outside and redeem us and set us free. Um, and so even though it's kind of an uncomfortable image for us to think about, uh, especially just internally, thinking about how uh, it applies to us, I mean, I myself have been um, was once enslaved to sin, but in Jesus I've been set free. And we'll get to the fullness of that in just a little bit. But I think it's important to start there for the appropriate background. Uh, Passover is so meaningful because the Jews had a very um, a prominent and well-developed understanding of just how bitter the slavery was that they were in under Pharaoh. So similarly, we should have that same kind of background understanding for celebrating the freedom that we have in Christ because the state of slavery to sin was bitter, bitter bondage, as Leon Morris talks about it. And then on the top of page 90, 
Uh, he quotes from Exodus. He says, this is a quote from Exodus, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This idea of when God sees the blood, he will pass over us. Um, I think the, the best parallel for this in the New Testament is 1 John 1, 7, which says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Um, it's a bit odd to think about the idea of blood cleansing something. But the idea is that Christians are um, kind of like a house, the, the house, the doorposts that were covered with blood in the Passover sacrifice, that we are covered spiritually with Jesus's blood. And so that when God looks over us, when he sees us, he doesn't see us as we were in our sinful, sinful state. He sees us as we are, as purified and righteous and covered by Jesus's blood. And so the wrath that we deserve is passed over. It is, it's not given to us. We are not judged or punished as we uh, deserve, but because of Jesus and the covering of his blood, we are uh, blessed, we are saved from the wrath, the judgment that should be ours. Similarly, on page 92, um, Leon Morris uh, says that the fundamental idea of the Passover is deliverance. Um, this is, again, the, the slavery image. Um, if if the state that we were in was slavery to sin, the state that we are in because of Jesus is that of freedom. We have been delivered. We have been set free. The Jews were set free from slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt um, physically. And that was an image, a picture of what was coming in the cross in Jesus that we are going to be and we have been set free, delivered, taken out of the state of slavery such that now... Um, following Jesus, following his commands, living the, the life of discipleship to him, we are actually free to do that. We don't have to, uh, Paul says over and over again, you are free from sin. Don't present yourselves, don't present your bodies as slaves to sin, but rather present yourselves as slaves to righteousness, um, which uh, is, is such a fundamental shift. I mean, just uh, to understand just how radically God has transformed our state, to understand that we were enslaved to Satan and sin and death, and now we have been brought out, we have been delivered, we have been freed into life, uh, eternal life, and also into following disciple, uh, following Jesus, being his disciple. It's a radical shift. And then um, another image that I appreciated so much from uh, Leon Morris was on page 98, in the very middle of the page, and I think this is very appropriate to this time right now of social distancing. He says, Passover was a time when the idea of community was very prominent. Jews gathered from all the world to keep a feast, a fact which was significant in itself. Passover was not purely an individual affair to be observed according to individual taste. And then skipping down to the end of that paragraph, Passover was a time for the collective joy of the nation, not the private happiness of individuals. Our culture so prizes private happiness um, and making uh, uh, an individual's desires and an individual's happiness the ultimate thing. Um, but Passover and scripture kind of push against that, um, kind of um, caution us that uh, our own individual desires and wants and happiness is not the ultimate thing. Rather that we are brought into, we are saved into, delivered into a community of people. Um, a fellowship of people, people that meet together regularly and, um, and eat with one another and play with one another and pray with one another. Um, obviously, uh, in this time of uncertainty and anxiety and some kind of uh, some isolation and some perhaps loneliness, um, this idea of Passover as a fundamentally communal act where people came together and ate a meal together in each other's houses, I hope it increases in us, I hope it develops more and more in us this sense of uh, desiring to meet together, desiring to be together, to eat together, to fellowship with one another. And I hope it makes us more thankful when we get through this and we will get through this. Um, I hope it makes us more thankful for that very first Sunday when we're all back together, that very first women's Bible study when we can finally meet again in the parish hall, that very first um, men's dinner, uh, steak dinner, when we can have one again. I hope um, 
the, the things that we do together as a church. I hope that this time um, of having to be isolated from each other increases our desire, our want for those times of togetherness and being close to one another in fellowship again. And I think it will. I think it'll absence makes, makes the heart grow fonder. I think um, the, the isolation that we're going through now will um, flower into some fruit of uh, deeper fellowship and love for each other. And I appreciate that that's an aspect that Leon Morris brings out in the nature of Passover. Um, uh, again, um, another insight that I thought was, was helpful was on the top of page 100. Um, uh, and now we're kind of shifting modes into uh, Jesus's fulfillment of Passover. And the idea was at the very top of page 100, uh, the writer, that is a, a Jewish writer, was so sure of this idea that the Messiah was going to appear at Passover that he says that if anyone appears at a time other than Passover and claims that he is the Messiah, he is to be rejected. Uh, this sheds new light, I think, on uh, Jesus's choosing to die at Passover. Um, we've talked a few times about how Jesus was a Messiah that the Jews didn't necessarily expect. Um, but in this way, in this, uh, in this avenue of his fulfillment, he actually is doing something that they would expect. They expect the Messiah to come at Passover. He reveals himself in his fullness as Messiah uh, during the Passover feast. Um, the, the bottom of page 100 highlights this as well, that uh, Jesus chose, he makes a deliberate intentional choice when he's going to die. Leon Morris does a great job of describing how Jesus could have intervened at all sorts of different points, but he directs the narrative, he directs the history of it uh, very specifically and very deliberately to make sure that he fulfills Passover in its fullness. That's why um, I think one of the best lines in this whole chapter was the, uh, towards the bottom of page 102 when uh, Leon Morris says, Jesus' death gave what the Passover pointed to but could not give. We've talked often about uh, the newness of the new covenant, the newness of the work that God is doing in Jesus. And uh, this, again, is just something so rich that the Passover was a shadow. It was a picture. It was an image and a rich one. But we, as Christians, we have the reality that all of these shadows and images pointed to. That's such, uh, sometimes it's hard to grasp and understand that um, these, these things that we read in the Old Testament are so rich and they sound so wonderful, but they are simply the images, the shadows that are pointing towards Jesus. What we have in Jesus is the reality towards which Passover was uh, pointing. Um, and so we have an even greater uh, understanding and an even greater experience, an even greater reality than the Jews ever could. Um, and one of the ways that that is, I think, primarily um, indicated, primarily it comes out, primarily in a Christian's life, is in the middle of page 103. Leon Morris, um, again, does a great job of this, um, talking about maybe the shadow that Passover um, showed forth, but the reality that we now have in Jesus. Very middle of the page, he says, the believer is forgiven, but not only this, he has victory over evil. Jesus' death gives us the victory over evil, Satan, sin, death, hell, that uh, we could not win on our own. Passover may, for the Jews, have looked forward to a time when God was going to deliver them via the Messiah. But Passover, for us, in light of Jesus' death and resurrection, is no longer an image, a point, or a shadow. It's a reality. We don't have to hope for victory over Satan, sin, death, and hell. We don't have to hope for victory over the evil in our own lives. We can be assured, we can know that because Jesus has died and rose again from the dead to defeat all of these things, that the victory has already taken place. It's already been accomplished. It's already there in reality for us. And that's, uh, I think, a very hopeful thing, especially for me, um, just knowing that I'm still sinful. <laughs> I, uh, I still mess up. And in our reflection questions at the end, um, we'll take time to reflect on that. But the victory that I need over any sin that I have in my life uh, is already mine in Jesus. It's already won for me. I don't have to win it for myself. Jesus has won it for me. And therefore, um, whether uh, now or the next day or when Jesus comes back, the victory over sin 
um, in my life is going to be one. It's not up to me, it's up to him. He's going to do it. And that's a hopeful thing, that whatever you're struggling with, whatever your particular sins are, um, they are not the final word on your life. They are not the state in which you will stay. God will eventually, uh, maybe it takes a long time, a lot longer than we like, but God will liberate us. He will free us ultimately from sin, whether now in this life or when he glorifies us when Jesus returns. We're not just forgiven. We have the victory over evil in the cross and resurrection. And then finally, the last highlight um, was uh, just for me thinking through uh, how um, prominent some of the Passover imagery is in the Book of Common Prayer and how uh, the, the Book of Common Prayer moves us to thinking about Holy Communion, especially in Passover terms. Um, in fact, every communion during the fraction, uh, there's the phrase every time. Christ is referred to as a Passover every week, every time we take communion, according to the Book of Common Prayer, there is this moment where we re-remember the Passover um, feast that Jesus fulfilled. And I think that's a, just one of the, the many great things about our liturgy, the many great things about the Book of Common Prayer, how it ties all these things together and, and impresses them maybe slowly but surely into our minds. The, the Book of Common Prayer also uses the term Paschal Feast uh, more than a few times. Um, you, can, uh, you can go searching for it if you like and, and, and find it. You'll see that it refers to this whole complex of Jesus' death and resurrection and Good Friday and Easter as the Paschal Feast um, and how we celebrate and remember that um, week in and week out and especially around this time of Holy Week and Easter. Um, in fact, um, Eastern Orthodox Christians uh, refer to the season of Easter as Pascha, which is simply the word for Passover. Um, and so Passover um, is a very prominent uh, way of understanding uh, Jesus' uh, death and resurrection, and not only that, but the whole season, the whole uh, celebration that we uh, maintain uh, year after year of his death and resurrection in Holy Week, and especially the, the season of Easter. And, and so those were just a few of the highlights of the Passover chapter and the atonement. I hope that was helpful. Um, again, if you have questions, if you have highlights, if you have something that you thought was uh, particularly important, uh, I'd love to hear from you via email or, or phone, or I'd love to talk to you about it. I do want to leave you with just a couple reflection questions um, for you to, to think about. Um, and the first is this, of all the things that God has delivered you from, for which are you most grateful? Of all the things that God has delivered you from, for which are you the most grateful? Um, I'm not particularly good at that. In fact, as I was writing this question, um, I thought to myself, I better answer these um, for myself uh, if I'm making other people do that as well. Uh, so I think I'll take some time to reflect on that. But it is, it's a helpful practice um, just to remember what God has brought us through. Uh, and then uh, the second question is this, where in your life do you most need the deliverance that Jesus has accomplished for you? And what steps can you take to move toward that further deliverance? Um, Jesus intends, he wants, he desires to uh, deliver us, free us from all sin. Um, and even though that will never be perfected in this life, there is always uh, growth that we can experience. And not only that we can experience, but that we will experience. Again, he's the one that does it. He's the one that sanctifies and grows us in holiness. Um, but he works with us in that process. And so it's worth reflecting on where we still need the deliverance of Jesus and what we might do to enter into deeper and deeper that deliverance that he intends for us. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been a blessing to y'all, and I really hope to be back with y'all as soon as possible.